One of the most important roles any couple can ever have is the role of being parents. And the Bible has a whole lot to say about what biblical parenting should look like. So today, as we learn what scripture teaches about parenting, we'll start with one simple word to help us remember all that we'll be learning as we go. And that key word is leading. The truth is that God gives every child a set of parents to shepherd their child's heart in his ways until they grow up and reach the point where they can leave their parents' home to begin a home of their own. And based on my studies in the scriptures, the process of parenting a child biblically involves seven basic things that can be summarized by the word leading. L stands for love. E stands for educate. A stands for adhere. D stands for discipline. I stands for intercede. N stands for nurture. And G stands for the final goal of the process of leading, which is godliness. Now, the obvious first thing that every parent must do for their child to lead them in the ways of the Lord is to love them. That's why Paul instructed Titus to teach the older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Paul wanted church leaders to teach the older women to admonish the younger women to love their children, among other things. And every parent should love and prioritize their child's eternal soul above their occupation, personal comforts, ambitions, and so on. When we realize that God has entrusted every parent with the awesome responsibility of caring for some of his most precious creations. And when we see our children as God sees them, we will never have a hard time loving them. Jesus said, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. So we must learn how God loves children if we're to love them in the correct way ourselves. And God sent his only begotten son to save every single child from the wages of sin, which shows us just how much he truly loves them all. But at the same time, we must never love our children, our parents, or our spouse more than we love the Lord, because Jesus also said, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. We must love God first, above all others. Then our spouse comes second, and our children come third, to keep things in their proper order. Because any time we get things out of order, we'll stumble into the sin of idolatry. And every parent must continually recognize that the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. So the Creator has only temporarily entrusted every parent with the child that they've been given as transitional custodians. But ultimately, they still really belong to their Creator. And... In that context, we can say, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Children truly are a precious blessing from the Lord. And while we recognize that they still ultimately belong to him, we can love them and 
Keep a biblical perspective towards them. And we must remember two important facts. First, no parent can ever love their child more than God loves them. And second, every earthly mother and father is responsible before God for the body, soul, and spirit of the child that they've been entrusted with. And that's an awesome and eternal responsibility. And this leads us to the most important biblical command the Bible issues to every parent, and that is to educate the child in the ways of the Lord, since they really belong to Him. And please understand, the Bible does not place the role of education on the state like our present unbiblical society does. No scripture doesn't mention sending your child to a school or to a teacher for them to learn the corrupt thinking of this fallen world. Instead, God commands every parent to educate their own child in his word. And he will hold every parent accountable for their child's education. And we can be absolutely sure God will not be pleased with any parent who knowingly sends their children off to a pagan school where Jesus isn't allowed to be mentioned, and the children are taught sinful, anti-Christ thinking about homosexuality, transgenderism, evolution, and much more. We know this because God specifically instructed, These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Did you notice God's word commands parents, you shall teach them? Truly parents are who God has appointed as the teachers of the children he entrusted to them. And the fact is that this verse covers just about every fundamental movement of the human body. If you're sitting, walking, laying down, or rising up, you should be teaching your children something about God's holy word, and especially his commandments. You can have a little break if you're running, but not much more. And this is the primary job description of a parent, according to God's word. The psalmist repeats this when he writes, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. God commands every parent to train up their children in his commandments, so a wise father will always teach, My son, if your heart is wise, my heart will rejoice indeed. I myself, yes, my inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak right things. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. And the wise mother will always teach, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. And the wise mother and father say these things 
Because the scriptures warn, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. You see, the eternal destiny of a child will be forever affected by how they were brought up. And the eternal salvation of their child's precious soul must be the primary focus of every parent. Therefore, every parent who is a follower of Jesus Christ is commanded to raise up their children in the training and admonition of the Lord. And because no intelligent person actually listens to a hypocrite when they teach, the next necessary step for every parent who's biblically leading their child is to adhere to what they're teaching themselves. We must practice what we preach. And that's why Moses said, only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And teach them to your children and your grandchildren, especially concerning the day you stood before Yahweh your God in Horeb, when Yahweh said to me, Gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children. Then you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the midst of heaven, with darkness, cloud, and thick darkness. And Yahweh spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of the words, but saw no form. You only heard a voice. So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. Imagine, friends, if Moses didn't follow the laws that God declared to Israel. How long would anyone have listened to or followed Moses? Not very long, right? So first Moses diligently kept himself, and then he told the people to diligently keep themselves while they remembered all that they had personally witnessed and heard. Then, as they obeyed the Lord, they were to teach their children to obey God also. We see this repeated later in the scriptures. As Paul said, Brethren, join in following my example, and note those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern. And Paul also said, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we don't have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Leading by example is the biblical way. But about the hypocritical scribes and Pharisees, Jesus said, The scribes and the Pharisees are seated in the chair of Moses, Therefore, do whatever they tell you and observe it. But don't do what they do, because they don't practice what they teach. Even as parents, we must always correct our own actions first, before we point out the sins of others. Because Paul asked, You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? I found it important to remember that people only hear and retain about 60% of what we say to them but they hear and retain around 95% of what we do in front of them. So a parent's example to their child is very, very important. And as we educate our children, we must understand 
that we are continuing our own education in the Lord too. Therefore, we don't need to feel shame when we learn something new. We must simply adhere to what we learn each day, admitting our faults and turning from them as we teach our children the life-giving process of repentance. And then we can apply the next important step of the leading process, which is discipline. And essentially, the overall biblical definition of discipline is temporal punishment administered to redirect a sinner away from the eternal consequences of sin. You see, sin is the breaking of God's law, and the eternal consequences of sin is the second death in hell. So discipline must always be intended to lead a sinner into life-giving repentance. That's why the Bible explains, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. And chasten your son while there is hope, and do not set your heart on his destruction. As long as you are in authority over your child, you are responsible to educate them in the ways of the Lord and discipline them when they sin against his laws. And the fact is, parental discipline is meant to gently foreshadow the eternal punishment of hell that awaits all those who refuse to obediently walk in God's commandments as they follow Jesus Christ. So, it's in the context of training up the children God has entrusted to you in his perfect laws that Proverbs explains, Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. But sometimes, instead of gently administering discipline in love and obedience to the Bible, because people can get distracted from discipline's real eternal purpose, it can be tempting to forgo correcting a sinning child, especially when people listen to the world around us that no longer thinks biblically about discipline. So, we must always remember why we are commanded to discipline if we are to think biblically about the consequences of a child continuing in sin. But I must also add to these principles the statement that discipline must never, ever be done in haste, revenge, or any out-of-control emotions. It must be done in patient love as part of a child's overall biblical education. In fact, all discipline must be part of a loving system of patient instruction and godly behavior. And the parent should clearly and calmly explain what sin the child has committed and what safe form of discipline is being applied as prescribed by the Word of God. Truly, a calm and logical mother and father can make biblical discipline a truly educational experience for a child. And that's how discipline should always be performed. All parental discipline should be administered with an eternal mindset that recognizes that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. And the rod and rebuke give wisdom. But a child left to himself brings shame on his mother. Because the Bible teaches children are born without the knowledge of good and evil, God commands parents to teach them to do what is good and to avoid evil. And if they refuse to avoid what God calls evil, the Creator commands parents to discipline or chasten their children to warn them of the eternal dangers of the evil path. Truly, 
Even God disciplines or chastens every child he receives. As Hebrews explains by saying, You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father doesn't chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of Spirits and live? For they indeed, for a few days, chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So, the goal of all discipline must be holiness and righteousness, and it must be administered in patient love in order to lead a child away from something the Bible calls a sin. Then, along with love, education, adherence, and discipline, a parent can remember that there is another tool they can turn to in the leading of their child, and that is to intercede on their behalf. David once prayed, O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of the heart of your people, and fix their heart toward you. And give my son Solomon a loyal heart to keep your commandments and your testimonies and your statutes to do all these things and to build the temple for which I have made provision. Now, ultimately, David's prayer for his son Solomon was not answered with a yes, because in his free will, Solomon chose to turn to idolatry due to his many wives. But it was right for David to pray to God on his son's behalf. And scripture also explains, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to Job. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. You see, Job stood in the gap for his children and interceded for them with God, just as David did for Solomon and the people that he led. And that's what we should do when we truly love our children. So every parent should remember to pray for their children, especially after they've truly led their sons and daughters with the first four foundational principles of love, education, adherence, and discipline. 
And the father of our faith, Abraham, gave us another example of interceding for his children when he said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Thus, because God has knit the hearts of fathers and mothers together with the hearts of their children, it is biblical and natural and good to express that love by praying for our children with a truly eternal perspective, pleading that God would protect their hearts, keep them away from sin, and lead them into an obedient relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. And godly leaders pray for the people they lead in the exact same way. But while we tend to the more complex and important spiritual needs of our children, we must also remember their basic physical needs too. And that leads us to the N in leading, which stands for nurture. Typically, even an unbeliever who's completely out of covenant with God gets this one right. And that's why Paul explained, if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially those of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Clearly, even fathers and mothers who don't know God or follow the Messiah tend to nurture their children. In fact, most non-Christians and even most animals typically provide for the physical and basic emotional needs of their offspring. So this is the most basic and simplistic role of parenting. But even this most basic component of a parent's role shouldn't be overlooked by the follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus once said, If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And Paul wrote, The children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And they said these things because even nature itself teaches that the helpless child should be tended to by their mother and father. Therefore, we must take care of the physical needs of our families and work with the skills God has given us if we desire to eat and serve God spiritually too. And just as God supplies our needs, by giving us bread and water from the earth, we must supply the needs of the children God has placed in our care from the abundance he provides. Now finally, we've arrived at the last letter of today's keyword, leading. And this next letter tells us the goal of all biblical parenting. You see, there are many Christian parents who love their children and they may have even educated them in some of the things of the Lord. In fact, they may even be faithfully adhering to the selected principles they taught, and many of them most likely disciplined as they saw fit, and even prayed for their children before and after they nurtured them through their childhood. But friends, even many Christian parents who do all of these things fail because they got the last letter of leading wrong. They may have made the goal of their parenting their child's happiness. They may have made the goal of their parenting their child's success. They may have made it their child's secular education, or they may have made it any number of other worldly things. But if they did not make the objective of their parenting line up, with the eternally minded objective that Jesus and the scriptures teach, then sadly, they miss the mark of true biblical parenting. Therefore, we need to apply the words of our Lord and Savior to our understanding of parenting. And friends, our Lord said, Do not worry 
saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Now for the sake of simplicity, we're going to summarize seeking after the kingdom of God and his righteousness with the word godliness. And the G in leading is all about the true goal of biblical parenting, which must be godliness. And we must recognize, just as Jesus said, it is the Gentiles around us that seek after the passing things of this world, like happiness, success, a secular education, fame, temporal health, and temporal wealth. But we are to train up our kids to seek after eternal things like God, His righteousness, and His kingdom. And just as we might use a compass to go in the right direction with every single step we take, the ultimate goal of biblical parenting must be correct, or all of the other steps will be in vain. Truly obedience to God, in faith, hope, and love, as we follow Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit, must be our own personal objective, and it should be the purpose behind our parenting too. Scripture says, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord and delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. And blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. So as followers of the Messiah, we should say, Come, you children. Listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. And we must remember, Jesus gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Therefore, we must raise children that are ready to follow the Messiah away from every form of lawlessness because they recognize the truth of his word and the real reason Jesus was sent by the Father. Then later, those same children will be much more likely to embrace the word of God when it instructs them Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers 
but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And we can find peace and comfort in the fact that the Bible clearly promises Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Sadly, many Christians have begun to doubt this promise lately. However, it's not as if the word of God has failed. The problem is that much of the church has forgotten what it means to train up a child in the ways of the Lord, as Abraham did. Instead, many have raised their children in their own laws and taught them to seek after the things of this world. And that's why they think the promise is failing. But today, we refuse to fall into those same errors, and together we pray. Father, help us each now Press forward in the faith towards our eternal destiny in your kingdom while truly leading the precious souls you've temporarily entrusted into our care into your open arms as their glorious heavenly father and into the nail-scarred hands of your precious son, their savior and ours. Jesus Christ.